You're very welcome. And uh, you may not know this, but you're here for a zombie apocalypse. Uh, my name is Jonas Hall. I'm known in the uh, forum as the Mad Mathematician, and I'm with the Swedish Geography Institute. This uh, is now recording sound and screen, so that you can watch it afterwards as many times as you want. So this is the way it used to be. Differential equations, a lot of manual, uh, pretty complex algebra. And it's not quite what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be without manual calculations. I wanted to use computers to do that and focus on the problem formulation and the analysis of the results. I wanted the students to have a large set of problems to work with and expand upon. Um, I introduced some mind tools for them. First one being the container diagram. Um, how many here know what a container diagram is? Right. Um, this is a way of describing the problem. Um, this particular problem is about children and grown-ups. When you're born, there's an arrow in the container for children, B, the Swedish barn. Um, but some ch ch children die, so there's an arrow out of it. Some grown-ups die, and children eventually become grown-ups. So this is a process diagram that describes what's happening. And typically, when you set up differential equations, each variable corresponds to one container. So that was one mind tool I wanted to give them. Uh, here is one of the students actually doing the, the write-up for the project. Um, and apart from that last one, every single diagram you see is actually uh, produced by students. The second mind tool I wanted to give them was what can you expect for the change? Is the rate of change proportional to, um, to the variable? If so, then the relative rate of change is constant with respect to the variable. And in this case, you get solutions that are exponential functions. But what if the relative change is not a constant? What if it changes? What if it, it drops? From this reasoning, you can work backwards and see then, then that is some sort of second degree solution. And the solutions to, to the original problem are logistic functions functions that grow initially, but then the increase is declining, so they level off. Uh, you can do the same with respect to time. What happens if the relative change diminishes with time? This is a, a common idea behind some population models for um, Mexico, for instance. Uh, and that will give solutions that resemble the statistic, um, statistic functions. Um, wow. There are two more chairs here. So, those were the mind tools. Um, I had also sets of guiding questions. What, what kind of containers? What will you expect in this situation that will happen to the rate of change? What will you expect with the relative rate of change? What does this tell you about the arrows? How do you construct the diagram? And then how do you translate that into differential equations? And afterwards, can you describe the solutions and see what happens when you change parameters? Here are some photographs. Um, you do need to write a little bit, even though there are no calculations on paper. You need to be very careful about the sign. This is 
typical classroom situations. We're not actually in the classroom, but in the corridor. Um, so, simple pollution problems. Uh, this is the very basic problem. You've got one container, you've got one arrow, you've got a pollution of diesel oil in a lake. It will finally, it, it will by time go out of the lake. Uh, but how long time will it take? And this will give you um, an exponential declining function. Uh, here it's shown with a slope field attached to it. With, uh, we're now coming to the zombies. Um, we've got a problem like this. We've got 6,000 inhabitants. And every night uh, they're attacked. And initially, for every 10 zombies, four more villages are turned. How long until 90% of the village is turned? Uh, so this is a slightly different situation. It's also only one container, but it's a different type of, of, um, uh, of growth because there's a limit of 6,000. So you can identify some parameters and you can work out the solution. And I'd originally written that problem without knowing the solution. These are the students' um, self-drawn images of, of the expected rate of change and the container diagram. And here's the solution. And the solution, ironically, turns out to be exactly 28 days later, as the movie. Um, epidemics. SIR model. We now move into several containers. Susceptibles are people who can attract a disease. I, for infected, those are the ones that have the disease. R, for recovered, those are the ones that have had the disease and are now, um, now don't have the disease any longer and cannot attract it. So there are two arrows here describing this. Uh, this will result in three different variables um, and the same type of structure can be used for, to model radioactive decay in, in chains like iodine decays to xenon decays to cesium. Typical solutions look a bit like this. You have the um, declining number of green healthy people, uh, you have a peak for the blue uh, infected that then decline as the number of recovered rice. Um, and there's another example of that, different colours. I just quickly want to go to Geogra to show you how you actually do this. You define the derivatives in terms of time and the other functions. And each term here re represents an arrow in or out of that container. So a minus sign represents an arrow out of the container. Uh, you start with a couple of starting values and then the actual command to produce the solutions is the numerical solve ordinary differential equation command. And it contains a list of the derivatives from time equals zero and starting values for those um, functions to x time equals 10. And you get this sort of behavior one parameter controlling the initial attack phase of the disease and one parameter controlling the, uh, the recovery. And there's the proud student. 
<laughs> um, we've got predators of prey. So we've got this problem. We've got antelopes have been observed to drop in number dramatically the last couple of years, while the cheetahs have increased, doubled their numbers. Are the antelopes endangered? The typical um, diagram here is, is from Lotka Volterra. The cheetahs, that's the G, uh, this is Swedish, remember. Uh, they've got a birth rate that is not only proportional to their number, but to the number of antelopes. More antelopes, more food. The antelopes' death number is proportional to the number of cheetahs. So this com combines and makes for a very nice interplay with cycles. And to the left you've got uh, the numbers versus time, and to the right you've got the number of antelopes versus the number of, of cheetahs, uh, which is known as a pace diagram, and you can see it just loops around and the number of antelopes don't really drop below 200 because they will recover. Proud so this is the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, this is one of the students who actually took one of the problems from the problem set and expanded it and did something of his own. So he's watched the movie three, The 300, right? Uh, so he's got a problem with 300 Spartans meeting 100,000 Persians. But only a thousand Persians can fight at one single time. Those are the middle ones in the front line. And they are continuously replenished from the camp so that it tries to fill up with it until a thousand. The death numbers for Spartans and Persians are proportional to the other lot because they're trying to kill them. And this will give you. A solution where the blue Spartans drop from 300 to zero in about three days. Uh, the number of Spartans fighting is more or less constant around about 1,000, but the numbers in the camp drop from about 99,000 to 92,000, so the Persians lose 7,000 people in those three days. Final example, zombie apocalypse. <clears throat> One student didn't really think the, that the, um, the, the SIR model was complex enough. So, um, <laughs> oh, and, and, and he said, I, I commented on his starting value with 350 million people and said that resembles the number of people in America. And he said, Yes, all zombie apocalypses take place in the USA. <laughs> and he made this model as a recoverable second stage infection like this. So you've got the susceptibles, you've got newborns coming in, you've got ordinary death rates going out, you've got the infection, but you've then got the second stage zombie infection, and you can die from being a zombie, but it can also be recovered if you find the cure. And here's one solution. The uh, number of 350 is actually off the scale, and it drops rapidly. You've got the first stage yellow infection, and then the red stage zombies that kill human beings, and then the recovered are blue, and they rise slowly and level off at 180 million, by which time America has been reduced by half. Roughly. <laughs> but he didn't think that was fun enough, so he made a version where recovery was non-existent, so America dies out after 15 years or so. Proud students. <laughs> So, um, some conclusions. It was an excellent student focus. We uh, had, with this topic, doing systems of differential equations, we moved outside the traditional curriculum and moved into university territory with ease. 
and students learn useful skills such as problem formulation, analysis, useful ICT skills, mathematical writing, and it did attract some interest. So there's, there's an article going to the local Manticho Swedish community, quarterly thing, uh, and there was some filming from the Board of Education. So, thank you very much for getting ready for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Not done it yet. We we finished this this semester, and I'm still sort of writing through all the student material. It will be there sometime. Okay. Yeah. Another question. How long did it take us to get to the We used roughly four weeks, of which the first one and a half weeks were getting to know the mind tools and the commands, and then two and a half weeks. <laughs> working with the problems. Um, they selected between three and five problems to work in depth with um, from a set of 20-ish problems. Yes. So different students did different things. Yes? Uh, I wanted to find out what was the final result inside the GeoGebra uh, file. Did they make a project or a presentation or a book? Yeah, well, there was a brief presentation as you saw at the end uh, and they, they had to write it up so so a typical problem would take two to three A4 pages to write up with mathematical writing and an explanation of why why we do this why we select uh, this particular model etc so so there's a good opportunity for me to judge their reasoning and, uh, and also, while they're working, there's a lot of discussion between me and them, and them and them. They work in groups, or they work like one person? Most chose to work in, in couples, but there was a couple that chose to work alone. Yeah. Did the students ever get into any trouble for any where the solutions break down? Mm -hmm. The equations are hard to solve. Um, not really broke down from, from a proper construction, no, but we did have some technical problems like Geoffrey Geoff didn't like um, falling with our resistance, so we had to go to the bottom alpha, fold it, get the exact solution, plug that into the other graph to get it dynamic. Um, so there's some, something like that, but nothing um, where, where the solutions actually break down, no. Anyway. <laughs> I just wonder if you accidentally came across. No, no, no. We were lucky, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>